Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining me today is Nolan Bushnell, the founder of the legendary video game company Atari, and he's also known as the godfather of the video game industry. He's the creator of arcade and in-home video game consoles and the games themselves, from Pong to Asteroids to many others. And Nolan created a new Silicon Valley culture at Atari, which was adopted by Apple and still exists today across the valley. He famously was also Steve Jobs' first and only boss, and after leaving Atari, Steve offered a third of Apple Inc. to Nolan. Nolan also founded Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater, another brand that's endured for decades in American culture. And he created 20 other companies as well, including ETAC, which was the first company to map the world within a meter, and that's technology that's now still found in Google Maps. In 2019, Nolan released his latest offering, a game called Saint Noir. It's a board game for Amazon's Echo, and it won many awards, including Innovation of the Year at CES. He's the author of the acclaimed book, Finding the Next Steve Jobs, and he's been featured in hundreds of publications and many documentaries, including Tom Hanks' The 80s, award-winning documentary on CNN. And he's been called one of the most important people in the history of computer technology and video games, as well as being named one of Newsweek's 50 men that changed America. So please join me now as we talk to the legend himself, that is Nolan Bushnell. Well, hello, Nolan Bushnell. Thank you for joining me today on Virtually Speaking. How the heck are you doing? I'm having a great time. I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of in the middle of my lab, my man cave, and I've got everything here from oscilloscopes to power supplies to, uh, you know, soldering irons. I can build anything here and uh, computers. I mean, this is, this is empowering to me. That, I like it. Yeah. And I, I imagine you have a little bit more time than usual with the uh, current uh, world we live in, more, a little more time on your hands to create. And I know you're working on some incredible projects right now that you're very excited about, and I'm excited to hear about those as well. But let's first go back to the beginning of an amazing life and journey uh, for a man that Newsweek named one of the 50 people that changed America, one of the greatest inventors of our time, a man who uh, was credited with fathering the video game industry, and of course, founding Atari and creating Pong. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning and start with you know, how you got into that position? Well, I want to give a shout out to my third grade teacher, Mrs. Cook, who assigned me the science experiment on electricity. And that fundamentally changed my life. I, I went home that night, set up a card table, got all every piece of water, wire and flashlight and started inventing and never looked back. And then I became a ham radio operator. And here's a picture of me when I was in, you know, a ham radio, those, those are my radios. That's 11 year old Nolan. Wow. And, you know, it's really geeky. I mean, if you were a nerd in the fifties, you were in ham radio because computers were a million dollar things that were in the corner of a, of a university or a company. And so that was kind of fun. And, uh, and then I guess the, the next big, you know, Thing that changed was the whole idea. Let me put another one up here. I worked at an amusement park, and the amusement park was a close to my place. And I became really good at games, and knew that if I were to put a video screen in that in that arcade, that it earned money. So you had, you had played a little bit with a video screen on, and I think, one of those $1 million computers you were talking about. Precisely. And in fact, that's the other happenstance that went along, is that, you know, a guy named Dr. Evans at the University of Utah, he was the guy who, um, and here's a picture of him, he's the guy that really, if you wanted a video screen, connected to a computer in the 50s, there were three places in the world, Stanford, the University of Utah, and MIT. Wow. You know, 
who would have thought that the University of Utah, but that was, that was my university. And so it was really, really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. So, so those three converged and I knew the business side because of the amusement park. I knew the technical side because of what Dr. Evans had done. And all I had to do is figure out how to make it cheap enough. And the video game business was born. So you met Al Alcorn and you put Atari together, but you had another company before that, right? Well, my partner was, was Ted Dabney. And we developed a game called Space War. In fact, I've got a, got a couple of pictures of that here somewhere. Um, and they, let me, let me put this up just for fun. They, you'll love this. This was the game that we licensed to Nutty. I molded that, that cabinet out of modeling clay and, and it was scaled up. And, uh, and that, was, that was really the start. It wasn't totally successful, but it gave us enough royalty that we then started Atari. Well, it made a couple million dollars, right? It made a couple of million dollars, you know. But and that I was had, called Space War? It's called Computer Space. Oh, Computer Space. Space War was the game that was played in the universities. Ah. And so, so what we did then is uh, Al was our first employee, and he was assigned the, the task of doing Pong. And so... Um, I actually kind of got a picture on that too. So. What, what made you decide that Pong was a game you wanted to do when you first started Atari? Like, did you like Pong? No, it was not even considered a successful, I, I didn't think it was going to be successful. I thought it was a really simple game that Al Alcorn could do in a week just to get trained on our technology. Ah. And then, it, then we started tweaking it and it got funner and we tweaked it some more and it, it even got funner. But it was so simple. And, and one of the things that happens when you're an engineer, you overcomplicate things. Because mm -hmm. you think the more technically interesting it is, the more commercially viable. When the opposite is often the truth. <laughs> you know? And so, so that was kind of the, the thing that gave us. And, and this is Ted, my partner, and Alcorn with the beard, and me with the polka dot shirt. and. <laughs> was the other guy that we fired for various reasons and uh and that was kind of that was our team so and at some at some point you you realized that al doing the the job he did on, on pong and you uh working with him to make it as cool as possible you realized you had something and that that could be the game that you put on the video screen that you were talking about that you knew you could put in an arcade or in a bar and people would want to play it. Absolutely. You so know, is, is, that, is that exactly what happened? That's exactly what happened. And even worse than that, or more than that, <laughs> the, we got a service call. The game, the game had stopped working three days after we put it on location. And it turns out when we went there that it had stopped working because the cash box had completely filled up with quarters and it couldn't take any more money. Oh, so when it, when it got filled up with too many quarters, it would just stop working. Well, you couldn't get another quarter in to, <laughs> no, so so, that was, was that in a bar? Yeah, that was in a bar. It was the Andy Caps Tavern in Sunnyvale, California. And literally those are the kind of problems you want to solve. Yeah. You know? Bigger coin box. Yeah. Done. <laughs> so you had started with, I think <clears throat> the story goes, um, you, you and Ted had $250 each. Correct. And you never went, uh, got any, anybody else to invest in the company until you were selling, you had sold $10 million worth of those Pong games. Is that right? That's correct. So all over the country, people had that Pong uh, video game, you know, console in their bars and in their arcades. It's it, absolutely. And we were heavily copied. There were about 150,000 Pong games, of which we only sold about 40,000. Oh. You know, and so, well, hey, <clears throat> we had a garage shop. We didn't have a factory. We didn't have money. We did, you know, it was, it was all a big scramble. And, you know, we were running as fast as we could. But uh, clearly anybody 
we we were building them in a garage shop. Anybody with a garage shop could knock us off, and our patents hadn't hadn't uh, you know been validated yet. We didn't have enough money to do a patent fight anyway. So, you know. But we, then you had then you had another incredible step to Atari, which was another great invention. Was somehow you figured out we could take this inside the consumer's home. That's true. Well, before that, we did a whole bunch of different video games, including a driving game, including a rocket ship game. And, and we discovered that we had one skill that nobody else had. We could innovate. And we said, innovation is our core capability and to keep that alive. And, and we ended up just through innovation, gaining from zero an 87% market share of the coin operated game business. And when did Steve Jobs come aboard? Because Steve Jobs famously uh, never had another boss in his career except for you. And you, you guys hired him at Atari. And I mean, at, you know, I don't know what point he came in. So tell me that. It was, that 19, it was 1974. I think he was 19 years old. Wow. He was obnoxious to everybody, but he and I just got along famously. I mean, it was the thing where the engineers got so they didn't want to work with him. Ah. And so, you know, my theory has always been, you've got to have room in your company for outliers. You know, people who were maybe a little stinky and a little bit rude which Steve had in abundance. <laughs> and and um, so I put him on the night shift, the engineering <laughs> night shift, of which he was the only member. We didn't have an engineering night shift. <laughs> but there was, there was actually a, a, a method to my madness. I, uh, I knew that Wozniak would come and hang out. And Wozniak is a digital genius. And... Uh, and so I looked at it as, as hiring two, two Steves for the price of one. Absolutely. Wow. That's, that's hilarious. So they, so they were working on some of those other video games that you're talking about. Right. Uh, they did Breakout for me. Breakout. Okay. Massive, massive big seller. In fact, Breakout was the game that opened up the Japanese market for us. Mm. All didn't do well in Japan because people didn't invite other kids over to their house. So it was a two player game. Breakout conversely was a one player game. So you could play it and have fun. And that's what became the, the home game of, of Japan. So you were able to take your games essentially from the coin op machines and put them on screens in people's homes. Obviously that's what you. If, if it was a successful coin op game, it, the cartridge just knocked it out of the park. And that's where Atari really took off. And then eventually you wanted some more money to be able to do very well with the, the in-home console. So you went and that's when you met your uh, uh, investors in Warner. Correct. Well, you know, we were just trying to raise money. We were going to take the company public, but the stock market was kind of <clears throat> if at that point in time. And uh, so we wanted a corporate investor. And Warner came along and said, no, we want to buy the whole thing. And they offered us more money than I thought that I'd ever make. And so, you know, you get offered, if you made an offer that you can't refuse, don't refuse it. <laughs> right. And then of course, Steve and Steve also, I, I have to mention, you know, offered you a third of Apple. They wanted you to come aboard as an investor for $50,000. Uh, and you said no. And, and, and was it because you were putting all of your money at that time into Chuck E. Cheese? And, and robotics, or, or what, was, what was that? It was really more that I didn't think Steve was a good executive at that time. You know, you, you can't be a good executive if you're brash and, and nasty to people and things like that. And I, I've often thought that had I invested, Apple might not have been successful because the guy who did make that investment came on as the first president, Mike Markowitz. And he was like adult supervision. I mean, Steve at that time was like 23 years old, 24, and and really, you know, needed needed some serious tutelage just on behavior and deportment as well as executive training. And I think Mike Markle 
is actually one of the unsung hero, heroes of, of, of Apple's success. Because he trained, he trained also in a way Steve Jobs to become a CEO. Precisely. Right. That's, that's incredible. So you're saying no may have been a, a very key point in, in the, the company's success and Steve's success. That's great. It's a great well, way to look at it. <laughs> well, I have to do that. Otherwise, I cry. <laughs> But let's go back to the Silicon Valley, you know, ethos and the the change that, that you guys made. You know, obviously you did these things where, you know, I was saying there was a lot more freedom, but it was really about you saying yes a lot, right? And really empowering your people to take ownership and know that they could, you know, try things and, and you weren't going to, you know, stop them. I mean, in fact, Steve came into your office one day, right? At one of the, maybe it was the first time you met him. Didn't he say something like, you're doing this horribly wrong and I can fix it or something? Exactly. He brought in a circuit board. He says, your people don't know how to solder. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at it and he was absolutely right. There were all kinds of cold solder joints, but, which, you know, it's like a delayed failure because, you know, it, it's not firm and, and it deteriorates over time. And, and, and I said, can you fix that? And he, I said, can you set up some training and, and get people to know. And, you know, and the one thing you got to know about Steve is he was meticulous. You know, his soldering joints were perfect. Mm. Perfect. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that attention to nuance is actually one of the things that really made Apple what it is. It was, it was a, he cared about the nuance of things. And, and that was really, really a good thing. But also, innovation is about trust, you know, and innovation is hard. You know, you're doing something that hasn't been done before. There's a lot of risk, kind of, and people won't risk if they're not, if they don't feel like they're valued and trusted. And I tried to always let people know that as long as you do honest mistakes, no harm, no foul. That just means you're trying. And you uh, did that as an executive throughout 20 plus companies. You took risk and you kind of uh, never were afraid to try something. And because of that, you had a lot of failure, but you had a lot of success as well. Well, you know, what happens when you do things that are a little bit weird? Sometimes they're properly timed and sometimes they're not just the way the world works. And, um, uh, and when they're properly timed, a weird project turns out to be massively lucrative. I mean, stop to think about going to uh, VCs and saying, we're going to build a pizza parlor that is 10 times bigger than any pizza parlor you've ever seen. And we're going to put a great big arcade in there and kiddie rides and a place where kids can crawl around. And dancing, dancing uh, puppets. There, there's going to be talking robotic characters. <laughs> I mean, if you hadn't seen Chuck E. Cheese, that sounds totally insane, don't you think? Absolutely. You know? But you started that. You didn't need anybody else's money. You took Atari's money to start that inside Atari, right? That's correct. And and it was you know it was one of those things that that we did. And you know, hey, Chuck E. Cheese is just one of those crazy things that we knew had to had to work and it did and and this is me <laughs> Chuck E. cheese too and i don't want you I, I want you to notice up in the corner that's my first son my brent up there in wow the so that gives you a an idea of the time slot yeah and you knew that was going to be a wild success because again you had the experience in the arcades you had the coin op machine, ex, uh, you know, uh, experience and success, and you're like, I'm going to create a place to put my own. Did you only carry Atari games in in, in the Chuck E. Cheese? Whatever, at first? whatever would earn. Whatever. Uh, would earn. <laughs> well, you know, the math was real simple. We were selling games at that time for about two thousand bucks a piece. During their lifetime, in coin drop, they'd make thirty to fifty thousand. Wow. So you didn't take rocket science to say, Hey, I'm on the wrong side of this equation. <laughs> There's also a great story about how you, when you were creating Chuck E. Cheese, how now Chuck, Chuck E., is it Chuck or Chuck E.? I don't know, but Chuck is a rat, right? 
Correct. Not a good pairing with food. <laughs> okay, this is a weird story. I knew my engineers could make things talk and move and what have you, but we didn't have a single sculptor. And so what does the rat look, or what does the coyote look like? It's supposed to be coyote pizza. It was coyote pizza. That was the, that was the, the name that, that the pro project had. So I went to the amusement park show and they had a booth where they were selling walk around costumes. And I bought a coyote costume, had it shipped to California. And, you know, a week later, I called, I talked to the guys and said, how's the, how's the coyote coming? He said, what coyote? <laughs> I said, the coyote that I, I sent you from the amusement park show. Oh, that's not a coyote, that's a rat. And I said, how do you know? He says, well, it's got a big pink tail for sure. <laughs> and, and what happens when there's a caricature, you kind of, over, you, you add on to it what you think it is as opposed to what it's actually meant to be. And so I said, okay, I'm not gonna slow the project down. We'll just call it Rick Rat's Pizza. <laughs> Well, the marketing department just had a connection. They said, you can't, you can't name a restaurant chain after a rat. You just can't do it. And so I said, well, okay. Can he be a rat, but we'll kind of de-emphasize his ratness <laughs> and, 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 you know, name it something else so that it's like Mickey Mouse, and, you know, it's just a character and not a big deal. And uh, they said, yeah, we can probably do that. And so I said, we'll name it, but it's got to be a happy name. And, happy name yeah and they came back and said we've got a three smile name like chuck e cheese and you can't say it without smiling three times <laughs> and it's kind of cool that um it was a a a, a rad or a, maybe a mouse because you wanted to work for disney when i you did were when, when i first graduated from college i wanted to be an imagineer and i sent my resume probably three times nobody home i'm hmm. glad they didn't because you know that would have sucked up the video game business but you know you never know you know be careful what you wish for you might get it <laughs> absolutely so um at some point you also sold chuck e cheese i did i i imagine and and uh um what was the kind of that moment uh in time how many locations were there in the country when you sold? About 150 company stores about 180 franchises oh wow so over 300 locations yeah and when the system was totally built out it was about 550 600 location wow wow and unfortunately this week in june of 2020 or actually now it's just the beginning of uh, july 2020 uh we just had the news that uh they they filed for um bankruptcy protection of course that's something that a lot of businesses do, and, and it's happening a lot now during this COVID crisis. But I'm sure that uh, they know what they're doing, and it'll still be around for many years to come. Yeah, I mean, basically what, what's going on, I think, is that the, the private equity firm that owned them just layered on way too much debt. Mm. And so when you do that, all of a sudden your cash flow goes sideways, and uh, they're just going to get crammed down you know, and the, the bondholders are going to, are going to own the company or the banks, not the, the private equity guys. Right. Right. Well, that's good. I hope that my kids and I can go to Chuck E. Cheese uh, one day, just like I went with my friends and family back in the day, because uh, I remember when I was in that age range of, I don't know what it was, um, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11. That was, that was one of the best places you could go. We did a, a survey, and if you were eight years old, Chuck E. Cheese was your favorite place in the world by 100%. Wow. Like, we, we didn't interview any kid who didn't say Chuck E. Cheese was the, their favorite place. And it's still used today. I mean, I hear it almost weekly. I mean, knowing you and representing you makes me hear it more, probably, and, and more aware of it. But, I mean, I hear Chuck E. Cheese referenced just on TV or in movies and all, all the, it's like weekly. You, too bad you don't get some money every time that's just mentioned because that alone would be a revenue stream. <laughs> yeah. So 
obviously uh, so many things you've designed and created and invented. Um, one of the other really impressive things is, um, you know, something that you did to help uh, us even today, we all use it, the mapping technology. So you were on a boat that you owned, right? A 70 foot yacht and you're, you're, you're in a race. You're in the middle of a race, right? Tell right. us the story. We were going, for, we were, it's called the Transpac. And it's every other year over the 4th of July weekend. In fact, it was, I don't know if they're running it this year or not. It's hmm. odd. Year. No, it'd be next year. Ah. They only run it on odd years. Anyway, um, and we were out doing some navigation. And we thought, you know, I thought, you know, this would be really easy to do if we didn't have all this squishy stuff under us. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, you know, cars need to have help. Paper maps are hard to use and that sort of thing. And I said, you know, computers are getting cheap enough. And so my helmsman, who was a brilliant guy from SRI, the Stanford Research Institute, uh, was my helmsman. And we were over the chart table. It was like four o'clock in the morning because, you know, you have to run shifts, you know, when you're racing because you, you, you're, you're flying spinnakers 24-7. And, and you've got to have good people on deck for to, to do that. And so, um, you know, I said, when we get off this thing, I'll fund you and let's, uh, let's, let's do an automobile navigation company. And, and sure enough, uh, we founded a company called ETAC. And uh, ETAC was a wild success. And we mapped the, the world. And uh, so when you are looking on Google Maps or anything like that, that's my basic technology. And uh, it's now all the stuff that we did was owned by Tel Atlas and next. Another company you sold that uh, helped change the world. So you're saying in the Google Maps technology behind it is your mapping technology is in there. Absolutely. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. We had all the fundamental patents. Of course, they're run by now, but but it's uh, there. But don't forget my robots. My robots were my happy place and my downfall. I mean, the damn things. I you loved were too them. early. You were just too early. I wow. Was too early. The tech just wasn't ready. And that just really, but I loved these guys. And uh, it was a fun project. And so... Uh, what was the purpose? Were they supposed to like bring you coffee and bring, bring you your mail? Over, you know, run around, entertain you. Oh, this this is my other lab back when I was a little more, a little less crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and you must be pretty excited about robot technology today because I think um, has the technology caught up uh, with the with the ideas. Definitely has. the The problem is after you know i lost 28 million dollars uh oh on the robot and then i tried it again 4 years later and only lost 2 million dollars <laughs> and then i was going to try it again and my wife said she'd leave me if i tried it again. <laughs> no more robots <laughs> no more robots <laughs> we've been there done that well what is exciting to you right now about um technologies that are emerging. I know that you um, have still done a lot of work in games and you did the VR gaming uh, company a few years ago. And, and then just last year, you won the award for best innovation uh, at CES for Saint Noir, a game that you created, which is a board game, right? Which you use with your... Uh, Oh, there it is. Yeah, you use you use uh, uh, Amazon Echo, right, to to play right. the board game. I I figured that one of the things that the world needed was were better board games. I love board games. With with Echo, you have an AI that can answer questions, and like with Saint Noir, you're the detective and you're interviewing suspects, and they're answering you. Wow. Pathetic. So it's an interactive, it's an interactive murder mystery game. Precisely. But you can play it with your family or your friends. Yes. In your own home. 
and and we won the innovation of the year at the Consumer Electronics Show. I was very very and and we won seven awards on this particular game. Wow! So that makes me feel very like you know every once in a while when you get old you say okay well, I lost my mojo, <laughs> and and evidently not entirely. <laughs> no, you 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 will never lose your mojo because you're always working hard on new projects. And do you think that that board game kind of idea um, with the with the help of the artificial intelligence or the Amazon Echo is is kind of uh, leading you into a new area of of games and, and interaction? Yes, and 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 I think that what we're doing right now with Zoom, we're going to be putting Saint Noir on Zoom so people can oh. be it there, and we've got another twelve games in the in the pipeline that wow. we're going to be doing and and we're going to be integrating them all into a zoom like platform uh because i believe that people love to do games and you know we know from the video game business that there's an awful lot of people who like to play in the same environment but video games are twitch games they're really good if you're a teenage boy <laughs> but if you want to play with grandma and grandpa as a family, you got to have a different kind of game. And that's where board games come in. And, wow, yeah. And I just think that there's a whole untapped market there of, of uh, games that can be done that. Um, Absolutely. You know, and then another project, I, I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is really a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you about Weird Woods. Weird Woods is my current project. And it's fun and games in the woods. We're actually going to buy a forest somewhere, and we're going to turn it into more fun than you've ever had. For example, we can do ropes courses. We can do adventure, you know, treasure hunts. We can do, you've been to an escape room. Yeah. An escape trail Ooh. where you have to climb a tree or look under a rock for clues to get the combination to the gate to let you out in wow. under an hour or you die. <laughs> <laughs> so people are going to actually go to the woods and stay in your, you know, your glamping uh, tents or cabins. Well, see, we're going to have a combination of luxury uh, glamps. These are tents that have full linen, a in-suite toilet and shower. And then we're going to have camping spaces for people who don't have as much money. But the whole idea is these adventures and you you have to pay for them but they're not expensive and uh you know zip lines and rope courses and gauntlets and uh, we've got it's gonna wow. be it's gonna be a magical experience wow that sound that sounds incredible yeah so that's amazing you're working on that now you're obviously working on stuff all the time what keeps a guy like you going. I mean, I, I would imagine that during this time of, you know, uh, everybody kind of being locked down, you're still pretty optimistic about the future and you're pretty optimistic about the industry that you're in. Um, what, what keeps you so optimistic and what keeps you working so hard on, on creating? You know, it's actually the opposite. I have a very short attention span and, and my life is totally about keeping me from being bored but that's cool because it makes you look for the cool thing that's going to capture your attention and then you work really hard on it to make it go and you fail or you or you succeed but you give it you give it all you've got and so many failures lead to a lot of success as well yeah and and once i get it running like a swiss watch i totally lose interest in it and that's when i have to sell that's amazing what a concept and you have um, such a success in games, and it seems like it's because you understand exactly what people want. You understand, you know, what makes a game work. You understand, you know, um, what people are looking for in order to be excited. I've heard you talk about, you know, um, when something's really difficult that you're really happy. And then I know you also have a law attributed to you, Bushnell's Law. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about those two things. Well, there's kind of two laws that, that I get quoted a lot about. 
The first one is any idiot who's had a shower has had a good idea. It's the person that gets out of the shower and does something about it that makes a difference. And, and I say that if somebody says, oh, he stole my idea. No, you didn't own it. <laughs> you know, just because you got the idea doesn't mean that you own it because you didn't do any work, work on it. You were lazy. You, you know, people who work on ideas can somehow own them a little bit. But just having them, it's not yours. And there might be multiple people working on an idea. Then you have to be the best at it. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the, the nuance of execution is, is really the driver. The other one that I get quoted on a lot is that games have to be simple to learn and very hard to master. <laughs> and, uh, or, or impossible to master. And that's a characteristic that, uh, that I think is uh, through life. But when you talk about me having my finger on the pulse, I cheat. I have eight kids <laughs> and, wa and a wife, and they all keep me relevant. My wife is much hipper than I am. And when I do something that is old fashioned or kind of set in my way, she whacks me in the side of the head. And, <laughs> <laughs> does it. and my kids do the same thing. Uh, you know, they've said dinner, the dinner table with the Bushnell household is verbal hand to hand combat. <laughs> and and then it's, it's six boys and two girls, right? Five boys, three girls. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, they, I don't know how it happened, but they all think they're leaders. How can you have all leaders in a family and no followers? <laughs> well, because they had a great leader, you know, to begin with, the, the parents, uh, you know, the leaders of, of the family are the parents. And obviously, I mean, all of your kids are incredibly successful. Some of them are inventors. Most of them, I think all of them are entrepreneurs. You definitely have give, instilled these guys with and gals with, um, you know, the confidence to pursue their dreams and to create. Yeah. So you must have started them young in the kind of same monikers that you had at Atari and in all of your companies. Kind of like try it, go for it. Don't don't worry about failure. You might get hurt. You might, you know, not succeed, but keep trying. That's I'm sure you taught that to them. Yeah, and and you know. I think access to tools and stuff is important. I mean, kids need to learn how to synthesize very early. And, and I, I've talked to you about this before, but hot glue guns are magic for little kids. You can stick anything to anything. <laughs> yeah. But they're going to burn themselves. They just will. And, uh, and then they learn not to. <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of a lot of mothers, they say, I've never let my kid, my four-year-old play with a glue, hot glue gun. And I said, well, you're, gonna, you're hurting him, you know, <laughs> or, or her. Uh, you got to, I would let my kids use any of my tools except the ones that would cut their fingers off. <laughs> <laughs> and, so what? You know, and, and I think that's the right thing. Have a rich environment, not rich for money, but rich in you know, discarded paper and, and styrofoam and wood. I mean, I grew up, my dad was in the construction business, so we always had a wood pile and a garage full of tools. And so I had this, this panoply of stuff to play with. And I was always building toys. I, I never bought toys. Wow. So, um, you know, right now we're in this, crazy time. There's a kind of a stoppage. There's kind of a pause. There's kind of a reflection that we're able to do inwards uh, of our own companies and of ourselves and really resetting, I think, for, um, you know, what's coming next. And obviously a lot of technologies have been put in front of us that we really weren't getting to for another several years, but now it's like all sped up because of this. So where do you see, um, in three, five, six, seven years, um, you know, society. Do you think that we're going to be um, basically where we were, but some new technologies were, will emerge, or do you think there's some things that are permanently going to change or emerge uh, from this this kind of pandemic situation? 
Well, I think that uh, there's two or three things that, that are going to be good. I think that people are going to be a lot more careful about supply chain. For example, you know, the fact that the United States doesn't make antibiotics anymore, that's, that's a stupid thing, you know? And so <coughs> I think we're gonna be onboarding a lot of businesses. I believe that business is gonna be more efficient. I think they've discovered that what we're doing with Zoom and various things, that it's, it's okay to not get on an airplane at the drop of the hat. So I think that there's going to be a bias towards online working an online education and online gameplay. I think that that's going to be forever biased in that direction. I think that in general, we're a very resilient people. We're a resilient nation. And I think that, uh, we'll learn some things. I do know that whenever you have a discontinuity or a singularity, the people who figure out how to deal with that singularity first thrive, and the people who are caught unaware and can't innovate with that singularity when the, the singularity is, is changing the structure of their business, i.e. destroying it. <laughs> You know, you have to be, you have to be clever when things change and you have to change with it. You just cannot hope for it to go away because it may go away, but it'll, but it'll go away leaving an imprint of change. And change is the constant. Yeah. And do you think that times like this accelerate companies like an Apple or a Google or a Zappos or an Atari, where there, there's like a forced innovation because there's major changes happening? Or do you think that those companies always change the world anyway, no matter what? And, and, and why do they, why are, why are those companies different than the other ones that don't change the world? Like what's the difference in the culture and the mindset? I, I basically believe that being at the top of the hill is somewhat transitory. I mean, when I was growing up, IBM was considered unstoppable to the point where that now IBM is a, a cipher, you know, and then Microsoft, it, it, they were going to break them up. And, and I, I kind of think that, that uh, I see some cracks in Google right now and, and I don't, and, and if you look at the difference between Apple products and Samsung products, you know, right now, Apple is a fast follower. And though they've got a very, very loyal and entrenched customer base, being a fast follower isn't a winning combination in, in the technology field. So I believe that you have your day in the sun and, uh, and, and then the sun sets. And I believe that in 20 years, there will be a different set of superstars. Do you have any companies that you really like right now that are kind of in that, you know, Amazon stage when Bezos was talking about it and people are like, nobody's going to want to spend their money online and trust the internet with their cards. And is there any company that, that you or, or companies or industries that you like right now that, that are kind of uh, at the beginning of, uh, of domination. Yeah. And, and all three of them are, are owned by me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about some other ones like that, uh, that, that you don't own that you are impressed with or that you're um, you know, that you're inspired by. I'm, I've been doing a lot of research and, and I feel like water is an important thing going forward. Uh, or lack thereof. Yeah. So energy efficient desalination is very interesting to me. And there's a couple of companies that are doing some really cool stuff. One of them's out of Israel that's just brilliant. Um, I think that energy production is, is an important thing. Um, you know, because so much of what we're doing on energy is is important in, in aquaculture. 
I'm a big believer that, I mean, our oceans are basically deserts once you get 100 miles off the coast because they don't have any nutrients. And you can fertilize the ocean and all of a sudden grow amazing stuff, hmm. you know, from, from algae to krill to what have you. So these are, these are areas that I think are on the ascendant. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, <laughs> this is the one that raises everybody's eyebrows. But you know what the most efficient uh, converter of plant to protein is? Termites. I believe termites in the future will be a major food source. Well, that's that's definitely out of left field, Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that's interesting. You ask you ask for some weird pronunciations, and so I gave. And then, and of course, I'm on the board of a uh, prone robotics who's got the smartest guys in automa autom automated vehicles, um, and and. You know, self-driving cars are more important than world peace. The more people are die on the highway than in any of the wars. And so getting rid of traffic accidents is probably the most life-preserving thing that we can do. And then it just does some other things, like I want to have all our cities garden. I, I want to have uh, all transportation you know, underground and, and uh, automated. And, you know, I, I, I want to be able to go downtown and not see a car and only hear the birds chirp and not hear them. And, you know, have, have cafes spreading out on the grass. The world can just be a better place than it is. And I want to be able to drive from Santa Monica or get, a, get transportation from Santa Monica to downtown in three minutes. 200 miles an hour, you can do that. And you can do that with underground transportation that's directly there. So you think that's kind of what uh, Elon Musk is doing with the Boring Company? Which Absolutely. He's trying Elon to is a smart guy. Yeah. Deep down inside, he's a smart guy and he's willing to play with the future in a very, very wonderful way. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so have you been able to, and it's amazing to sit with you and really pick your brain about how you look at the world, how you look at failure, how you look at risk, how you look at innovation and creativity, um, because you are one of the greats and one of the greatest people alive who've done that. So thank You're you. Too kind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too kind. I'm, I'm hitting the nail right on the head. And um, thank you so much, Nolan, for inspiring us and for also creating some of these things that uh, uh, I, I wanna personally thank you that have touched me in my life, the Atari 2600 and that whole revolution and that whole, that whole industry. I used to go to this uh, arcade near my house, Westworld, when I was growing up. I mean, it was the greatest thing ever. We'd go there for hours and I'd play Galaga and Centipede and uh, some of your games and, uh, other games and just for hours it was so much fun and then Chuck E. Cheese I mean thank you for you know enhancing my childhood and so many other people's childhoods and brains as well so thank you for that and thank you for coming on the show today it's been absolutely amazing I really appreciate you it's been fun <laughs>